Have you ever considered becoming one of those entrepreneurs who start up their own business? Or would you prefer the security of working for a large company, but maybe dealing with entrepreneurs on a day-to-day -day day -day basis as part of your work? Today we are going to discuss the careers of two very interesting people, and we're going to go a step further. We're going to talk about how a small company can deal with a large one cooperatively so that both of them can become more profitable. Stay tuned for careers. My name is Peter Wolfel and welcome to Careers. Our first guest today is Roger McClelland and he is the founder of PCA Personal Computers Associates Limited. Welcome to the show, Roger. Hello, Peter. Roger has uh, his, started his company from his home, but he also has now agents and representatives in other parts of the world. Also joining us is Peter Hinton and he is the Senior Business Development Engineer from New Business Ventures Division of Ontario Hydro. And he is responsible for product licensing and technology transfer. Welcome to the show, Peter. Thank you. Roger, you used to work for IBM, a large, powerful, secure type of company. Why did you decide to leave this kind of environment and go off on your own? Peter, I wanted to find excitement. I wanted to do something I really wanted to do, and that was run my own business. And I found, a, found an opportunity, and obviously I took hold of that opportunity and ventured out on my own. And it's proven to be successful. Oh, great. Well, um, are, these, are these some of the common motivating factors that people start up businesses because they're bored of what they're currently doing? Or? Peter, it's hard to say, but I, I would think the key motive would be to uh, run your own business, have fun, make money, and then be able to really expand the opportunity into other parts of the world. At least that was my perspective. How did you go about starting PCA, Personal Computer Associates? It really goes back to the time when IBM introduced the personal computer. At that time, I really felt, had a gut feeling, I should say, that it would take off. So I started to look for opportunities in that arena, and I came across a product that a manufacturer in the United States was selling and didn't have a distributor in Canada. So I phoned him and asked him for it, and he gave it to me. How did you find this product? By reading a computer magazine. Okay, and you just thought it was an interesting product, and so you, you thought you'd give them a, a phone call and see what the status is with it. Yeah, that's precisely what I did. And uh, I was lucky, I suppose. He agreed to give me the distributorship, and I ran from there on. Why do you think they gave you the distributorship? For two reasons. One, I gave him a convincing story. I think I communicated uh, a lot of confidence. Mm -hmm. Secondly, he didn't have a distributor. He hadn't even thought of Canada. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, those are the two key points, I think. Okay. So from there on, your company has grown. Yes, we have grown from uh, one product to approximately 90 to 100 products today. So we distribute uh, five major lines, including AT&T power suppliers. <laughs> That's quite a, an amazing success story. Did you, are each of these products licensed products, or are, they, are some of them developed by yourself? Uh, no, they're not, Peter. Uh, they're actually products that are manufactured in the United States. We import them and distribute uh, through our channels, uh, through the computer channels, dealer channels locally. Okay, okay. Now, when you negotiate <coughs> some of these rights, do you ask for... Um, any special conditions, or are you? Are they asking for money up front? What's what usually is the case? It all depends on the product, Peter. But what we have tried to do is to ensure that we could get a product at a better price than the distributor, d distributors in the United States would get. And secondly, we we make sure that we get terms also, mm -hmm. and we don't pay money up front. Okay. Okay. I guess there's a lot more products available for licensing than there really are good licensees uh, available for 
marketing these products. That's true. Do you feel that in a way it's kind of a, a buyer's market? It's hard to say, Peter. Depending on the product, okay, mm -hmm. depending on uh, whether the product has any uh, long-term uh, value, uh, so many factors that go into the consideration, it's hard to pinpoint and say this is so specific to a product. Mm -hmm. Let me get back to, to the first product again that you got a license for. At the time you were working for IBM, what was your position there? I was actually in the finance department. Okay. Now, didn't it take you quite a bit of uh, soul searching to actually leave a company like that? You were doing it for a while at the same time, I believe, right? What, what I did, Peter, was I, I asked my wife to run the business. My, my father-in-law is a consulting engineer. So initially, I ran the business through his office, but it came to a point where it was a, a nuisance for him. So I brought the business to my home, and I asked my wife to run it. So that's the way I was able to contain it for approximately three years. For three years, your wife actually ran it right. while you continued to work at That's IBM. Right. Okay, so that helps minimize some of your financial risk. Correct. You had uh, children at the time as yes, well? Yes, I had two and children. A, and a mortgage? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I guess that's quite a risk. Okay, yeah. thank you, Roger. Peter, what's your background and how did you get involved with Ontario Hydro? Well, I'm an engineer and I joined Ontario Hydro about 10 years ago looking for new challenges. Um, I've always felt that you should be doing something that you're interested in doing. That's the most important part. Um, to keep challenged with interesting um, horizons, interesting products, and interesting people. And what I'm doing right now, I think, is, uh, is, is a fantastic opportunity that I have got dealing with people and with new technology right on the, on the, on the development edge of some of this new technology. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not only helping Ontario Hydro, but it's also helping the community at large. You had some other experience in industry, though, before joining Hydro. Yes, I, I've worked as a design engineer early on, and I've worked in the industrial gas business. Mm -hmm. All of them were in interesting and enjoyable positions. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we all like to have changes and uh, see new horizons. Mm -hmm. um, and by making the move to hydro, I think was it was a change. There was nothing wrong with what I was doing before, but I needed I needed a change. When you joined hydro, you started in their supply division. Yes, I did, uh, as a okay. procurement engineer. Now, having had some outside industry experience, did that help you in that? Job? Oh, very much. The um, one of the criteria for joining that division was that you did have industrial experience. It was it was most important. I think uh, in, that shows in your career that. Building experience is very important to the next step. Okay. Um, you now work for a division within Ontario Hydro called the New Business Ventures Division. And they have a slogan that uh, we do more than make electricity. What else do you do? <laughs> yes, it's, it's something relatively new in Ontario Hydro. Um, Ontario Hydro is such a large organization, we've developed a lot of expertise in technology. And it's it was decided that it would be a good idea to get a lot of this out and into the marketplace to help other people. We do a lot of consulting work for the third world. Mm -hmm. We also um, have a lot of expertise in computers and software and control of, of, um, of uh, producing uh, electricity. We're marketing some of this information. And who, what kind of companies do you market that to? To other utilities. Mm -hmm. um, and to some government services in, in the third world. There's also the aspect of the, the, the technology that Hydro develops. And here Hydro, I, th I gather it has the, the third largest research organization in Canada. And as such, does a lot of very original developmental work. Mm -hmm. This technology is, has been developed to suit Hydro's needs, but it can be used by other people, other utilities and other industries. And it'd be a great shame just to keep it locked up in our own house. And it has been decided that we should market this. It's also a very profitable venture to market this technology. But one of the most important aspects that we have is to try and get um, Canadian business interested in this new technology to license this technology from us and to take it 
and market it all over the world, North America and in Canada. And I think this is a, these are great opportunities for other businesses to talk to us. I see. Yeah. So what exactly is product licensing? What does it mean for our viewers? Um, what it means is that if we have developed a certain product, we will give you all the technology, if you are the person who is going to license it, we'll give you all the technology to be able to manufacture it. Now, you in turn will pay us a royalty for this information. Um, we always have to make sure that the royalty is a practical royalty. Mm -hmm. we don't, we're not trying to um, take all the profit and motivation away from mm -hmm. the company. But what we're trying to do is recover some of our development costs. And who we license to is very important to us. Um, and and, the, and the one of the more difficult parts of, of the whole, whole uh, business yes, is to find the right company who has the, the, the capability of handling this technology and, make, and being able to make it into a useful product. Mm -hmm. And who, the company should also have a good marketing capability. Otherwise, it does nobody any good. If it doesn't get into the right hands, uh, nobody will be able to use this, in, this information. Or this. So would some of these companies only have marketing capabilities and maybe subcontract the manufacturing to it somebody else? It is quite else? possible. If they have a good um, method and system of handling it, yes. Are you finding it difficult to find good companies? It's not easy. Let's say it's not easy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I heard that some of your other criteria in, in licensing are also to try and just transfer the technology to the private sector, as a, to especially Ontario companies, to be a good corporate citizen, this kind of thing. Yes. We don't like to emphasize Ontario companies. It would be nice. But basically, we're talking about Canadian companies mm -hmm. to benefit the entire country. Mm -hmm. Although this research really was funded by the Ontario ratepayer, electricity ratepayer, it's, uh, it's too... too partisan to keep it in, in Ontario itself. I see. What about the inventors? Are, do they get anything out of this? Ontario Hydro has a policy for rewarding its inventors, yes. Okay. The policy has changed and it gets into um, an, an awful lot of intricate detail to describe the policy, sure. but basically, yes, they do get rewarded and they do get recognition. Are they, do they get more motivated by knowing that their product is being oh, used definitely. outside of the company and not just oh, yes. Ontario Hydro? Yes. Okay, great. Roger, what were you looking for when, when you negotiated your, your first licensing agreement? Peter, I wanted to make sure that we would be in a position to, first of all, do business with a big company. And secondly, we knew that we had a, a marketing team in place to market the products. The key was, how does a small company do business with a big company? I think we laid the groundwork to demonstrate, though we were, small, though we were a small company, that we had the resource and the uh, capability to do a good job. And I think we conveyed that confidence, uh, for example, to Ontario Hydro. Okay. And they, in turn, uh, were prepared to do business with us. Okay, we're going to take a short break right now, but when we return, we'll continue speaking about how an entrepreneur can deal effectively with a large company. Stay tuned for Careers. We're back. Our show is called Careers, and today's topic is the entrepreneur and how it deals effectively with a large company. Today, um, I'd like to know how you decide, Roger, on what products you'd like to license. There obviously are, are many different products out there available for licensing. How do you, first of all, how do you even find out about these products? Peter, there are, at least for me, there are two ways. Uh, one is personal contact through the networking system I have in place. The second is uh, trade journals. And coming to the specifics of Ontario Hydro, uh, it really came through uh, the networking system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, to answer your question, how does one select a project? Uh, it's a very difficult process because uh, you have limited funding, limited resource, and basically look at the product and you make a decision, can I market the product? Can I sell it? Is there money uh, in the project? And if there is, then we go ahead and make a commitment to the product and the project. And you make some forecasts of how much you can sell and how yes, much we do. it's going to cost you. Yes, we do. I see. 
Well, to, to launch a product must be very expensive. How do you promote a product? Peter, we have taken a very innovative approach. Uh, firstly, we use the trade journals. Uh, invariably, we find that most readers read the editorial comments or new product information. So we use the uh, new product information bulletins, uh, news releases as the first media. Secondly, we do mailings to our customer set. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, we do mailings to the corporations that could be interested in our product. And fourthly, we go to trade shows. And fifthly, we advertise the product. I see. Okay. That's the most expensive uh, way of really uh, bringing the product into the marketplace. But we find that news releases are free, new product information is free, editorial comments are free. So what you also do is talk to the editors directly. And if you can convince them that the product has merit, they'll run an editorial for us, mm -hmm. uh, which again will allow us to gauge the level of interest by the consumer. Have you had some good success in getting their interest? Yes, we to have. To run some free yes, promotion for absolutely. you? absolutely. Okay. But typically, uh, promotion and, and all the, the startup costs must be quite expensive. Um, do you need some additional funding to get these things going? And if so, how do you obtain that funding? Yes, we do, Peter. At times, uh, we are definitely run into that kind of situation. For example, we are working with a new product, a data compression uh, product that's proprietary to us. Uh, we needed about 300000 for that particular product. And I went out to my friends and spoke to them about it, and I seeded the company uh, with funding from friends. I see. And this particular product today is being marketed in Australia, in the United States, in uh, Switzerland, and uh, more recently we're integrating that technology uh, with a modem. So you issued shares to some of these friends? No, I, I've been very fortunate. I, I I, I'm working with them on the basis of profit sharing oh. or high rates of interest. So okay. I, I was able to protect the company. Okay. Well, that's good. Instead of licensing a product, have you ever thought of trying to develop a product yourself? Yes, we have, uh, as in the case of the main fr mainframe product, but it's a very expensive process. Mm -hmm. uh, given the opportunity, I'd rather uh, license the product because of cost savings. Uh, technology changes very, very quickly today. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want to obsolete a product before it even hits the marketplace. And thirdly, really to get the product into the marketing channel very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, we buy somebody else's technology and do it. Okay. When you license a product, are you finding that the original company, the one that developed it, is probably already marketing it in their own home country or into some other geographical territory? We have essentially entered into exclusive contracts, so we have not run into that kind of problem. Okay. Okay. But what I'm saying is, let's say in your first license, yes. you got this license from a company that was in the United States. Yes. Were they already marketing that product in the United States? No. We uh, transferred, they had the technology. Okay. And we asked them to transfer the technology to us, and we got worldwide rights. Oh, I see. But they, they must have been starting to market it because that's why they were having an ad in the trade journal in the first place, wasn't Actually, it? they were talking in terms of a different product altogether. What we did was take the technology and then uh, we devised a new product. Okay, okay. With Ontario Hydro, you licensed a product last month, I guess it was called the Electric Field Strength Indicator. That's correct, yeah. Um, basically, what does that do? It's a device that, that allows you to test the strength of a line when mm -hmm. it's live. Uh, it's a device that an electrician or linesman can mm -hmm. use it uh, uh, manually. That's the... Uh, okay. And what got you interested in it from the very start? Again, came through the networking uh, system I had in place, okay. and it appeared to be a product that I could market because I had the channels in place. It appeared uh, it was an exclusive product, and uh, I presumed that I could make some money out of that. Mm -hmm. Good. Did were you also thinking about trying to improve your relationships with on Ontario Hydro? At Absolutely. The same time? We are, we were already sent to Hydro, and I felt that if we could get in there and we could have a relationship, uh, licensee license saw relationship that the ability to market my other products to larger corporations would also be enhanced. I think we achieved that. Mm -hmm. So there are some benefits from also a, a promotional point of view of being associated with a large company. Absolutely, yes. Okay. Back to you, Peter. Um, when you issue a license, do you sometimes issue more than one license for the same product? Yes, we could do um, for different geographical areas. 
We may find one company that is very strong in marketing in North America, but not interested in marketing in Europe, but might find another company that can handle the European market. So yes, we would then have non-exclusive or exclusive territorially, and, and as a result, have uh, more than one licensee. Mm -hmm. Also, in some cases, the technology can be adapted for different uses, and certain companies have different have uh, expertise in certain areas. Um, a device which can be used by one part of industry, but with a little adaption can be used by a totally different industry. The companies may not be able to market into the two industries. It may be too difficult. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they don't have the sales force. So um, there is a specialization. I have heard that there are times when a company actually prefers to have a non-exclusive license, for there to be more than one supplier of a product that they are licensing. Yes, it, it, this, this does happen. And in these cases, it's probably because um, the more the merrier to bring the new technology onto the market and gain acceptance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, some, and the, their combined marketing effect is greater than the some of the individual parts. I see, I see. Some customers, I guess, feel more confident in buying a product when they know that there's more than one possible That's true supplier. too, yes, yes. Okay. Now, when you license a product, do you guarantee any kind of sales to Ontario Hydro? No, no. Um, naturally, uh, they would be in a very good position to make sales to Ontario Hydro. Mm -hmm. But we have very strict regulations as to how we may purchase products. And it must always be on a competitive basis. So your, mm. your division actually is operating independently from the supply division of Not the totally independently. We do keep the supply division informed. Mm -hmm. The companies that get a license would be asked for a quotation. Mm -hmm. But that, does give, that makes no guarantee. I see. Great, great. Roger, what are your company's future plans? Peter, what we want to do is have a company that can market globally. We want to have an office in Europe. Uh, we have an office in the United States today. We have a rep in Australia. We want to design new products. For example, a product that we're working on right now uh, allows you to use our technology, uh, the computer technology, and using your brain waves to interface with the computer. Okay? And we expect to have a prototype ready by end of August. So that's an exciting uh, project for us. We want to come up with new products that uses uh, today's technology and technology that has been used in the military, for example, okay, that we have been able to license or where the knowledge has come through the trade journals. Mm -hmm. That technology you mentioned sounds like something out of a movie, Firefox. You're right <laughs> on, Peter. That uh, conveys the concept. That's, that's great. Do you have any suggestions for other people out there who are maybe thinking of starting a business for the first time? Yes. First, believe in yourself. Secondly, make sure that you have your family's support. It really helps. And thirdly, make sure you have adequate funding. And fourthly, make sure there's a market for your product. And get the help from your friends. Uh, seek advice. Don't be scared to ask for advice. Right. And do you think that it's a good idea to try and do it on the side, burning the midnight oil? Because I, I know of, of friends who have tried to start a business, but they found it virtually impossible since they just haven't had the time to devote to it. Peter, if it is so hard to say what one should do. Mm -hmm. That's an uh, approach that worked for me. Right. And it may work for someone else, it may not work for someone else. And that's why you find venture capitalists prepared to advance funding if the project uh, has merit. Uh, the other way to do it is to quit your job and then make sure you have enough money to fund the project. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of ways to really finance a project. I've heard that uh, one of the best ways of trying to raise money, though, is to have some kind of a business plan, which you in turn take to the banks or to venture capitalists. Did you use a business plan? Uh, no, I did not, Peter. Uh, anyone can come up with a business plan today with uh, the availability of computers. The key is to make sure that you can communicate uh, to the people who are funding your project that you do have a, a viable product and there's a marketing channel for it and mm -hmm. that there will be product acceptance. And if you can communicate that, the numbers will come together. I think you need a plan to show where you're headed and where you're going to be. Great. Hey, uh, Peter, in your area, 
product licensing. What are your future plans? We have uh, a lot of technology we want to get out onto the market. Our research division is busy developing new ideas, improving old ideas. There will be a constant flow of new technology that we will have available for licensing. Um, right now we have a big backlog because we're relatively new in this business. Mm -hmm. But as time progresses, we'll probably become much more sophisticated. Excellent. Do you have any suggestions for other companies, maybe, who are also in the same situation as yours, who have some technology which they would like to license? I think a lot of companies are looking at doing this. I think a lot of uh, <coughs> major companies are trying to find revenue from all the sources they can. And if they have expertise, I think they are trying to market it. Okay. Well, Roger McClelland from yes. PCA Personal Computer Associates and Peter Hinton from Ontario Hydro, thank you very much for joining us today on Careers. Um, before we go, I would like to say a couple of words, and that is we would like to continue to improve the quality of this show, but in order to do it, we really would appreciate have, having some feedback from you, our viewers. If you have any suggestions for other television shows, for some topics, a particular career that would interest you, or maybe if you have a guest in mind that you'd like to see interviewed, please write me at the following address. Peter Wolfel, host, careers, care of Graham, Cable 10, 35 Scarlet Road, Toronto, Ontario, M6N 4J8. I'm Peter Wolfel, and from all of us here at the studio, Good luck in your own career.